Welcome to this week's Artist on Art. I am your host, Nada Milkovich, and I have such a great pleasure to be introducing as our guest today, Dr. Polly. Paul, thanks for coming into the into the station. Nice to be back, Nada, 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 Ging, Ging, Ging. <laughs> Paul Lee was uh, one of the first professors here at Crown. Second Cal- year, 1966. Second, 1966, and you were brought to teach philosophy. Yeah, first at Cal, and then I went to Crown in 67. And what did you teach? Oh, philosophy, um, religious studies. Uh, Dean McHenry asked me to start the program, and I taught in the history of consciousness. Dr. Pauly has been a great movement, I would say. Many things have started with you, Paul, uh, here in Santa Cruz, and I feel like we are the better for it. Uh, We have a lot to talk about, um, but one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on today is because you're going to be teaching another course, a spring 2014 course, Who Killed Cock Robin? And this will be in the Cowell Conference Room, 132, and it will be Cowell at, Senior Common Room at the Cowell Senior Common Room, and the the class will be. You will be teaching the class from three to five on Wednesdays during starting the, April second during the spring 2014 UCSC quarter. Anybody can come. And the Cowell, uh, to sign up, you need a permission code, which you need to go to the Cowell office, but it's uh, Cowell1995. See Emily at C- the Cowell office. See <laughs> Emily. And so we're going to talk about this uh, spring course, which has been a little bit of a controversial, although, Paul, you're pretty used to being controversial, aren't you? No, I, I'm still bored. You're still bored. I You're like, so boring. I'm not controversial enough. Um, he's uh, controversial in many ways that we're going to talk about today. Um, here at Artist on Art, the art of philosophy, the art of activism, the art of learning and thinking. An is organic what, gardening. Is what we're going to be talking about today. Also, Paul was just recently in a fabulously successful, if I may say so myself, event that just occurred on Saturday at the Hotel Paradox. It was the third TEDx Santa Cruz event, and Paul was one of the speakers during the event. And would you mind telling us a little bit about what was your topic? What was your idea? The thymus thump. The thymus thump. That's really... What the heck is a thymus thump? It's a spiritual exercise and a therapeutic exercise. You tap the area of your thymus gland, which is just below your chin, just above the cleft in your uh, chest bone. And that's where the thymus gland is, the master organ of the immune system. A lot of people don't even know they have one. And it protects you against uh, illness and disease. Your T-cells, which the thymus programs are your frontline defense against illness, anything that would, you know, injure you. So it goes back to the Greek word tumos, T-H-Y-M-O-S, with an O uh, accent over the O, tumos. And it means courage, vitality, and spirit, in the sense of biological spirit. I want to bring the spirit and the soul back into the body where it belongs as its root. Uh, right in the middle area. What the heck are you talking about, Paul? I thought that the soul and spirit were obsolete philosophies. No, yeah, I know they are, but they need to be uh, revived. I mean, people need a soul, they need a spirit, they need to know they have them, and they need to know it's bodily based. There's this thymic field that uh, is in the region of the thymus gland, and this is our um, uh, bridge between reason and desire. It's a, it's a region of uh, the courage to be, as my teacher Tillich called it and translated Tumas, wrote a wonderful book about it, very popular book. And it's vital self-affirmation. I mean, who doesn't need that? So the thymus thump is an uh, effort to uh, introduce people not only to their thymus gland and the thymic field, which is the field of one's soul and one's spirit. And so you can reactivate uh, those important features and virtues by virtue of doing the thymus thump. Okay. So how hard do you do the thump? Right, just, uh, t- do it affectionately. Uh, when uh, Matthew McConaughey does it in uh, The Wolf of Wall Street, which just blew us out of the water. I mean, it was so funny to see him do it. He does it too hard. He almost knocks himself out of his chair. 
And uh, but anyhow, he's doing the thymus thump, and he does it principally for the purpose of raising the resonance of his voice. That's fine. That uh, you can feel your voice behind your hand if you put it in the in the thymus field uh, on the top of your chest. So it was fun to see McConaughey doing it, and uh, I got a big kick out of that. So uh, I've been doing a lot of research on this thymus thump, thanks to you, Polly, because you brought this up in the past, and there are a lot of uh, places you can go online where people discuss the thymus thump and how healthful. Really, I didn't even know that the practice is. And when I heard Matthew McConaughey uh, talk about doing this the first time was last year on uh, another fabulous radio host, Terry Gross, and she um, and basically they. Uh, recorded him without him knowing it while he was doing it in preparation for the radio interview. Hmm. And I've heard him speak about not only does he use it as a way to lower his voice so that he sounds better, but he also does it in rhythm to who his character is. So as an actor, he feels that it helps him get in the truth of what the character, who the character is um, that he's playing. So each one of his characters has a different rhythm, has a different thymus thump that Mm. he uses to activate um, himself into this character role. So there's there's something else that I think is interesting that correlates with what you're talking about. Because he's talking about taking the mind as an actor and bringing it together with his body. Centering it. Centering it. Yeah. And so he's centering himself to be able to have this character move through him in what he feels is an authentic way or hopes to have in an authentic way. See, so many people feel an emptiness or a sense of loss in this middle region. And it's because we're so mental and we need to be brought down to the root of our mentality, which is this middle region, this bridge between reason and desire. So there's, so there's the, the mindfulness, the, the, the active brain that we're using to walk around our consciousness. There's also the desire, the, the some would say animal-based desires of the body, which you talk about being lower in the body, located lower. It's for mine, huh? Perhaps the first chakra, if uh, those of the audience know what I'm talking about. The very root, uh, near, um, below our belly buttons. And so you believe that this thymus is also where the mind and the body split. That was so well done by Greek philosophers 2,000 years ago, that this is actually where That disappears. This is where it's the union of the mind and the body. And it's where soul and spirit interconnect. So, Paul, can you explain to us the argument that you have as to how the thymus could be the answer to a lifelong question I've had, this mind-body split? Well, the thymus gland is such a magnificent organ, and it really, for me, is the beginning of thinking of the relationship of the mind and the body. Here's the thymus gland right in the middle. It's the master organ of your immune system. It determines self versus not self. So if you want to talk about the centered self and coming into integration, it's neat to talk about or think about the thymus gland. And it uh, wards off illness and disease. And uh, it's got immune memory, which is a quasi-cognitive function. And in fact, the thymus is a kind of proto-brain. So uh, people ought to think more about their thymus and uh, about uh, the function of their immune system and let their thymus know that they know it's there. Anyway, so this is what you delivered. This is the talk that you delivered at TEDx Santa Cruz. I did. And as I don't know how many of you all know out there, TED, Technology Entertainment Design, is a conference that happens. It used to be in Monterey. and now. Uh, sometimes in Long Beach this year. I believe it's in Vancouver. And it's uh, for very quick presentations on an idea that is worth spreading. So what is it that made you feel like this was the idea that was worth spreading, Paul? People have to, you know, be uh, cued 
to their middle region, the bridge between reason and desire. That's such a nice phrase. One of the best descriptions of Tumas uh, that Tillich gives is the unreflective striving toward what is noble. That's a mouthful, I know. But it's where Tumas is wedded to Eros, and Eros is always uh, depicted in the, the Greek context as an arrow of longing. And uh, it's often um, understood as a chariot ride of the soul to the true, the good, and the beautiful. So this longing we have, this ultimate concern that we have, this, this spiritual self-transcendence is what Tumas does in alliance with Eros. And it's the unreflective striving toward what is noble. I mean, how many people don't need to be uh, assured that that's something that can occur to them by virtue of recognizing this middle region, this thymic field? You're listening to Artist on Art. I am your host, Nada Milkovich, and we're talking with Dr. Paul Lee today. Can we break down that that statement, unreflected, striving, toward, striving what noble. toward what is noble. So the unreflected, so it's That's an unconscious? It's below the mind. You know, it's in this re- middle region. Is it unconscious? Yeah, it's unreflective. So I don't know if it's unconscious. It can be conscious, but it's not rational. I mean, it's, it's pre-rational or sub-rational that it starts from this middle region. That's, that's, it's like the, it's rooted here. And it is our centered self in this uh, sense of longing for self-transcendence and what the Greeks called the true, the good, and the beautiful. In the Middle Ages, they called the true, the good, and the beautiful the transcendentalia. I mean, that's a good word. So is it what I'm born with as my passion, that which yeah. I feel I have to do, and that it's, it's, it's my it's, purpose? It's lifting it, too. See, that's why Tumos is read to Eros. So it's a it's self transcendence. It's a dynamic up. It's the dynamic up. So reaching got... reaching to the highest fulfillment and satisfying our deepest longing. So the unreflected striving, striving toward what is no. It's a, what the Greeks meant by wisdom. And what is noble? <laughs> what is noble? It the no. Uh, what I don't know. It noble is what is the highest uh, uh, qualification of being human. Noble is what satisfies our spiritual longing. Noble is what we aim for if we have any sense of what it means to be wise or to to, uh, search after wisdom. So if I thump my thymus, that means I'll get wise? Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Really? Yeah. Guaranteed. No, guaranteed. It's going to open you up. And uh, people, if don't, people think that this is empty, that they that something's missing, they've got to discover it. And the thymus thump is a way of discovering. That's why I call it a therapeutic exercise and a spiritual exercise. So not only will the thymus thump make me wise, but it will also help me with my immune system and fighting off. Like, a lot of people are getting ready for their finals exams, they're working too much, they're sleeping less, um, they're stressing themselves out. Would this be that moment in which to help invigorate the thymus, your your immune system, to work at its best? Yeah, it's fanciful at best to say that that might happen, but there is a new science called psychoneuroimmunology. Oh, hold on. I've got to say that again. Psycho- psychoneuroimmunology. I mean, is that a clumsy one? But it's an effort to trace the uh, effect of the brain on the immune system because under uh, situations of great stress, the brain secretes corticosteroids, especially cortisol, which affects the immune system negatively. So you have a reduction of your immune response under great stress because of what the brain secretes. So this is a neat way of beginning to uh, discuss or, you know, investigate the mind-body relationship through the thymus gland. So now they have a science that is the basis for pursuing just that effort. So, Paul, there's also been studies that have been out recently that suggest that the immune system has memories and that those memories can reach to their parents' memories of their immune systems. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, we basically inherit our immune memory by way of our mother. 
so whatever our relatives, uh, ancestors have suffered by way of uh, illness and disease, let's say you've had a series of ancestors going back through your mother to your grandparents, etc., who have uh, been subject to cancer. Well, you, you're at further risk by virtue of what you inherit from your mother in your immune memory, in your immune system. Makes you more vulnerable to the disease, so that's important to know. And uh, you know the anomaly of the uh, thymus gland is that it shrinks in size after it grows to its full size in puberty. And so you know, in a way, uh, your thymus thump is a means of uh, remembering that you have an immune center in the thymus gland. I don't know if it has any effect on it. I just like to think that if you, uh, you know, uh, pay affectionate attention to your thymus, it'll respond accordingly. There's also another uh, word that comes from tumas, which is an herb. Thyme, yeah, the herb thyme, thymus vulgaris. And how does that fit well, it's into... A, it's a, a germicidal disinfectant herb with those properties. It's basically a culinary herb. It's central to French cuisine, most likely because of those properties. It's central to Listerine as a mouthwash uh, that uh, uses uh, thyme all, which is the essential oil of thyme. So I've taken a huge interest in the herb thyme because it's the same word as the thymus gland. It goes back to this Greek root, and uh, it's always been emblematic of courage. So it's amazing to have this Greek root that uh, proliferates out into an herb and a gland and carries through the meaning of the Greek root. And remind us again what those characteristics are. Germicidal disinfectant. But it's also courage? Courage, uh, vitality, and spirit. And spirit. But spirited, biologically based spirit. And so you believe that if you spritz a little thyme hydrosol upon yourself or step on a thyme herb, tell us how the Greeks used it. Yeah, they grew it publicly a lot to step on it in order to release its uh, aroma, its scent which they thought purified atmospheres. And they burned it on alders, and they had a chorus that danced around the alder and smelled the burning thyme as incense. So I want to make a thyme spray with Nada. We want to do some herbal products, and we want to spray it on students. We don't. <laughs> in order to overcome their intimidation and give them courage and confidence. And so the thyme herb also can help with... Uh, Cleanliness, vitality, keeping yourself healthy, um, mental clarity. Yeah, and it's the evocative of courage. I mean, what st astonishes me is is when you smell time, when you pinch the leaves and smell it, it's it releases some kind of deep memory. You know, as if we're programmed for herbs in in a really deep way through the selection of certain plants over thousands of years for their various properties. I, I've even thought of there's an herb code in the immune memory of our DNA because of the selection for certain plants and, and the specificity of the aromas uh, one would never mistake. I mean, I would never mistake thyme for oregano or sage or whatever. The aromas are so specific to the plant themselves. And so, Paul... Polly, Dr. Polly, you mentioned that um, you want me and yourself to run around and, and spritz our students here at UCSC with uh, th time. Yeah, intimidation is a student plague. Uh, it's, it's institutionally um, uh, processed. I mean, going to university, you're basically intimidated. You sit in a class of 30 students, you think you're anonymous. You're not even there. And so I want to bring people out of the, bring students out of this fog of intimidation with a time spray that I call a demystifier. <laughs> and why do you think the students are so intimidated? It's the nature of the institution. I mean, you sit there and you listen to somebody talking to you. Uh, it's uh, the authority, and you take notes and. It's, it's a, you know, all you got to do is stand in a classroom and look at students and see how intimidated they seem to be. I mean, it's, it's apparent to me. I picked it up, first of all, when I would ask a student in a class a question, and he, he or she would look to their right or left thinking I was talking to somebody else. I'm talking to you. Aren't you here? And I started to think, yeah, they think they're anonymous because they're so intimidated. And that's something that's got to be overcome. 
You also have an idea that perhaps you uh, lose your soul while you're in the university. Well, that, Paige Smith, my great pal, the founding provost of Cal College, wrote a book called Killing the Spirit, and it was his indictment of higher education. He, you know, uh, the part of the course I'm going to teach is about how physicalistic reductionist science absolutely eliminated the soul and the spirit from what counts for knowledge. That's right. And so then you have like an idea where you would get like a coat check, except it'd be your soul check. Yeah, we were going to put up a, like a spiritual cloakroom at the entrance to the campus in the fall so that incoming students could check their spirit. We'd keep it safe and sound, you know, at least to the extent we could. And then when they graduate, they could come and get it back. <laughs> Because the whole process of becoming a university student and graduate kills the spirit. Yeah. <laughs> so we need more time and thymus thumps. You got it. That's right. I'm going to do whatever I can to overcome that before I die. So, Paul, tell us, how was your talk received at TEDx Santa Cruz? Oh, it was really fun. It was thanks to your coaching that it went so well. And um, I got a great response, and it, you know, it was uh, terrific to to tell 400 people about the thymus thump and the thymus gland and the Greek root meaning courage, vitality, self affirmation, courage to be. I mean, it's just meaning piled on meaning. It's such a rich uh, mine to uh, you know excavate. Did you get a standing ovation? Yeah. I, you told me. The room was so dark, I couldn't see anybody, but you said I did. And were there people doing the thymus thump? Uh-huh. They yeah, were. They were. They all did it. <laughs> I hope they keep it up. Because it is a good exercise. It's what Roman Catholics do when they confess their sins. And that, that's not a bad idea. We're in the period of Lent as far as Christianity is concerned. And uh, I, it, it dawned on me that because... This region is the region of self-affirmation and the courage to be. It's on the basis of that that you can confess your sins. Artist on Art, welcome back. We are with Dr. Paul Lee today here um, at KZSC. Dr. Paul will be teaching a class this quarter, this uh, spring quarter, and it is a cow class, 199F, and it's called... Who Killed Cock Robin with Dr. Pauly. This class is going to be given on Wednesdays from 3 to 5 at the Cow Conference Room. Senior Common Room. At the Cow Senior Common Room. And you need to see the Cow Office for permission code if you want to take the class for credit. And they need to talk to Emily. Is talk, that... talk to Emily. Talk to Emily. Okay. You get a registration code. So how how did you come up with this title, Who Killed Cock Robin, for your spring course? Well, Rachel Carson sang the Ballad of a Cock Robin, so to speak, with her Silent Spring, which showed the effect of DDT on robin populations. What What is uh, Silent Spring? It's, the, you know, the book that she published in 1950, in the early 50s. And it's credited with sparking the environmental movement because it uh, drew attention to pesticides and its effect on ecosystems. So she's considered to be the founder of the environmental movement as a result of the success and the popularity of that book, which opened people's eyes. And in a way, it led to Earth Day uh, in 1970, which was a weekend where the whole nation stopped to think about the late stage of the self-destruction of industrial society and the environmental crisis. So uh, I take the ditty Who Killed Cock Robin uh, because I'm interested in the collusion of physicalist science with undermining organic nature and leading to, let's say, the industrialization of agriculture and the food production system. So Who Killed Cock Robin? Cock Robin stands for vitalism. I... I, I take pains to go into the physicalist-vitalist conflict in the early part of the 19th century, which uh, erupted when they artificially synthesized urea and uh, were then able to uh, hypothetically go on to artificially synthesize anything as long as they could figure out the chemical composition. And they could do, they could uh, artificially synthesize anything in organic nature from inorganic sources. You didn't need the plants anymore. 
He didn't need organic nature anymore. He could do it in the experimental laboratory. So physicalist reductionism is my bequoir, and I'm I'm going to go after it. Your what? Your beast? Yeah, the black beast. Your dark beast. beast? Yeah. And I'm going to expose it because it's an interesting line. It starts all the way back with Galileo, who's responsible for the mathematization of nature. That's where it starts. And the uh, the uh, notion that mathematical physics is the basic science and determines what counts for knowledge. So uh, Cock Robin is vitalism, which was considered to be refuted and undermined and eliminated in 1828 with the origins of organic chemistry, where the word organic means artificial synthesis. Okay, parse that one. And uh, the sparrow, uh, who killed cock rabbit? I said the sparrow with my bow and arrow. The sparrow is physicalism, and the bow and arrow is the artificial synthesis of urea. Who will be chief mourner? I, existentialism, I'll be chief mourner. And it's just uh, historically incredible and appropriate that existentialism as a philosophical uh, movement of thought begins uh, within 10 years after the synthesis of urea. And existentialism is the quandary we find ourselves in with respect to industrial society where we're turned into an object or a tool and, uh, you know, uh, dehumanization, alienation, estrangement, that whole thematic, which is uh, the object of existentialism to try to figure out. Existence becomes a quandary. And then there's, I've even added a line. I said that, um, something about a fly. Who saw him die? I said the fly. I saw him die. Well, that's Rachel Carson. So it's a nice mnemonic to cover the major themes of the course. Physicalism, vitalism, the artificial synthesis of urea, existentialism is chief mourner for defeated vitalism. I think that's really clever. And uh, then Rachel Carson and the whole issue of Silent Spring and the effect of pesticides and artificial fertilizers on our food production system, which is all part of what Chadwick undermined and went up against when he started the first organic garden at university here in 1970, 1967. Alan who? Chadwick. Alan Chadwick. The embodiment and personification of Tumas. The embodiment and He was the vital root with two legs. And he was here to help us learn? Yeah, to return us to the integrity of organic nature. And so how did Alan Chadwick end up at UCSC? He's an English guy, right? Yeah, he was coming here to visit Countess Freya von Moltke, who was visiting the campus. I invited her to lunch. She said, I hear you want to start a garden. I said, yes, Countess. I had been to see the chancellor to propose a student garden project. And she said, oh, I have a friend coming. He'll do your garden for you. And that was Chadwick. So what happened then? He was ordained from on high to replant the vital root of existence in the late stage of the self-destruction of industrial society as a world above the given world of nature and therefore devoid of vital roots. Chadwick replanted us. And how did he do that? By developing the garden and doing it uh, strictly organically. He was the pioneer of the organic movement in this region and is credited as such. And uh, students were uh, attracted to him because they wanted to find something that spoke to their souls and their spirit. They didn't want to have their spirit killed coming to Santa Cruz. And Chadwick introduced them to a sacramental relationship to nature. A sacramental yeah. relationship exactly to nature. Exactly what Galileo undermined by mathematizing it. So how do, you, how do you get a sacramental? What is that? Well, I'd like to go back to the doctrine of creation, but I don't want to be branded as a creationist in terms of going up against science and so on. I, that, that's a debate I don't even want to get into because it's a, it's a mixed logic. There's a famous logical fallacy called metabasis ice allogenos. You don't mix oranges and lemons. So you don't talk about uh, mythical symbols as if they were scientific statements. That's the creationist science debate, which is nuts. 
I'm interested in the concept or the doctrine of creation as good. God created and saw it as good. Unambiguous affirmation of the goodness of creation. That's what's sacramental. And I can see that in a seed sure. when it sprouts. Sure, grain of sand if you want to. Take acid, it helps. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. But that, you know, a lot of students took acid in the 60s, and they had some sense of uh, longing for the sacramental and what would be considered sacred. And so Chadwick provided that to them because he had that understanding of organic nature as sacred and a gift from God, and he treated it as such. And from the garden, there's a whole, the farm. Yeah. Was created and an apprenticeship program. Yeah, that came after Chadwick. That was... Uh, he had apprentices here. I mean, many of the students that flocked to him in turn became uh, his apprentices, followed him even when he left here. And so he had, a you know, like a small army of students that he um, taught and nurtured. But after he left, the agroecology program began to carry on the work, and they have an apprentice program. And I call it an unintegrated appendage to the university because they come in separate to the university. They enroll in the six-month program, and uh, it's not um, at the university. It's at the agroecology program. And this uh, this has continued on. Yeah. And there have been... Hundreds of people probably that have, thousands by now that have graduated and they have uh, spread like dandelion yeah, seeds right. all across the United States. You know, the Chancellor talks about the garden as one of three things he's most proud of regarding the university. I, I was delighted and stunned to hear him say that. And so, when the garden began here with your help and Alan's backbone, I guess he's the one who worked really hard. <laughs> he's the guy that did 18 hours a day, seven days a week. I think it was two years before I said, Alan, you ought to take a weekend off. <laughs> and so uh, there was another chancellor from UC Davis that heard about this organic garden. Yeah, vice chancellor of agriculture. And he had a problem with that, didn't he? Well, somebody wrote and complained, said there was a cult that had fixed itself on a slope at uh, Santa Cruz, <laughs> and, the, the stu- and they're not using uh, chemical procedures, industrial procedures, exactly what the university should teach, exactly what they taught at Davis. What was going on here? Well, it was obviously understood as a hippie plot and to further embarrass the faculty. And so it should be removed immediately. And the vice chancellor of agricultural sciences wrote back and said, I completely agree with you, but I think it'd be a better learning experience if the students watch things die because they're not using chemical fertilizers and pesticides, then to kick them out. Let it wither on the vine. And I thought that was Solomonic. And how? And look at it now. Yeah, it, it spurred the entire California organic movement. You know, which okay, is and then I remember across. somebody coming to the chancellor and saying, "Do you realize there's a madman out on that slope named Chadwick, and he plants by the moon?" And McHenry said, "My father was a farmer, and he planted by the moon." Well, that <laughs> shut that guy up. You artist on art. I am your host, Nana Milkovic, and I have the great pleasure of speaking with Dr. Paul Lee today. Dr. Paul will be uh, giving a class this spring quarter in Cow College. It is um, Cow 199F, and you need to go to the Cow office for a permission code. Emily will help you with that. It will be given every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. beginning April 2nd and the end of the quarter. And the class will be given in the Cowell Senior, Senior Common Room. Senior Common Room. When uh, when I had the the pleasure of uh, introducing you at the TEDx Santa Cruz event, they asked me why I was so keen on helping you get your talk up um, on this program, this program and the TEDx Santa Cruz program. And I said that it was because uh, through you I have. Uh, taken the vitalist oath and uh, that you helped me understand the difference. Also, I'm an existentialism uh, existentialist, and so a lot of what you say uh, does 
go with my, in alignment with my ideas. Soon after, a woman, one of the audience members came up to me and she said, you said something about materialism and vitalism. And she didn't understand what I meant. And I know you've talked about it a little bit today, but can you give us a little more clarity on what those two terms mean and how you will be discussing them in your course? Well, as I said, the, the issue starts with Galileo. And he was a materialist. Um, the Democritus atomism that starts in the ancient world in, in Greece, Democritus was a pre-Socratic philosopher who proposed atomism, and uh, was picked up uh, in a poem by Lucretius. And that was first made available in the Renaissance, and uh, it influenced Galileo. And it was a, a pitch in behalf of atomism, which is basically materialism. Everything is reduced to atoms. Material, the the smallest they thought then, the materialist entity, and so it uh, makes things mathematizable, and that's why Galileo picked it up. So uh, it, mathematical physics became the primary uh, discipline and it determined what count for knowledge. Well, by the time you get to the 19th century, you can add organic chemistry to the significance of mathematical physics, and uh, Organic chemistry is materialist from the get-go. Everything is a matter of physical and chemical forces. And so you get a reduction to matter is all that matters. And that's the materialist uh, line in modern science. So uh, they were thrilled to be able to undermine vitalism, the argument in behalf of the integrity of organic nature, and in effect collapse organic nature into the inorganic. And what's wrong with that? It's led to the, you know, late stage of the self-destruction of industrial society. I mean, that's what created industrial society as a world above the given world of nature. And so in a way, synthetic and artificial and uh, uh, virtual and simulated and like, 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 like. I met a student who every third word said like. I thought, what's he's so dislodged from reality that he can't get back to it, uh, and everything is like what he thinks it is. So th this this uh, synthetic environment that we live in uh, is all a consequence of the triumph of materialistic uh, scientism, physicalistic science, and industrial technology. And what does vitalism get me? Well, vitalism is almost a name for what got refuted. I mean, vitalism uh, wasn't such a big deal uh, because everything was regarded as alive. Well, once it was reduced to matter, then the issue of life became the big problem. So vitalism is a defense of what's of life. And I could say, and I got uh, uh, textual proof to back me up, that uh, for physicalism, life is the big uh, problem. They don't know what life is. In fact, they even say that there is no such thing as life, that life is not the object of scientific inquiry. I have quotes to that effect by very prominent scientists. So vitalism is the effort to, you know, affirm life. And uh, life is based on organic nature as far as I'm concerned. That's its most vivid example outside of human beings. And so vitalism, in a way, uh, was uh, returned through the environmental movement. The environmental movement and ecology are, are neo-vitalism. Vitalism reappeared in this effort to bring attention to the extent to which the environment was endangered and undermined. And that's the issue we face now and the peril that we're in. What are some of the people we're going to be reading during this class? Well, what, what was so fascinating with what Chadwick brought here with his uh, organic biodynamic French intensive uh, procedures was the um, tradition that went back to Rudolf Steiner, who developed biodynamics. And he's a uh, force fit. I mean, y y you can't find a an institution of higher learning in this country that would even teach a course on Steiner, even though he was a major. Uh, intellectual figure in uh, Germany and Austria at the er in the early part of the last century. He was uh, a, an incredible Renaissance man. But the problem was he was, uh, you know, he played with the occult. 
he was clairvoyant. You know, and how do you introduce a, a figure who is clairvoyant into a university curriculum? You can't. Same thing with Gurdjieff, say, for instance. I once had a student come to me and say, could she take a reading course in Gurdjieff? And I was probably the most, you know, far out guy here as far as allowing for such stuff. And I said, no, it, it's really across the line in terms of what counts for university studies. Yeah, I'm kind of ashamed of that now. But anyhow, that's the case. You can draw the line somewhere. Well, Steiner's where you draw the line. That's why it's so odd that it should have been introduced here through Chadwick. Steiner was very much influenced by Goethe. Okay, now you have Goethe as the preeminent vitalist of uh, Germany, the great poet and man of letters, the author of Faust, and also of practicing scientist. And he went up against Newton over a theory of color and optics and did experiments to refute Newton, of all people. Can you believe it? So the conflict between Newton and Goethe is the perfect expression of the physicalist vitalist conflict. And so we'll be reading uh, that line of thought uh, from Chadwick through Steiner back to Goethe, which is a wonderful, um, there's terrific literature uh, related to that. Goethe made a famous journey uh, in the uh, 19th century uh, to Italy, and he did a diary of it. It's his Italian journey, and uh, it's one of the wonderful texts to introduce students to. So... Anyhow, that's so, going to be fun to read. So you'll be reading Goethe. You'll be reading a book that you wrote, Polly. E. Yeah, uh, that'll be the text for the book. There is a garden I mean in the class. The garden in the mine. You also be will reading Rachel Carson, which you mentioned, The Silent Spring. You'll be reading Paul Tillich. Yeah, he, we'll start out with an essay he wrote. How has uh, science changed man's view of himself? Um, and that's a, he gave that as a centennial address at MIT. I was privileged to attend it. And I was Tillich's assistant at Harvard, and uh, that's a wonderful piece. So we'll read that. Oh, I should bring up, we put out a flyer uh, with the uh, uh, headline, Is Science Evil? I should have put physicalistic science. I don't mean science per se. Of course not. That's not evil. That's an important human pursuit. No question about it. But there's this odd ideological trend within science that I want to uh, clarify and expose. And so uh, Carly Aspers, the great German philosopher of the, of the last century, wrote an essay called Is Science Evil, where he discusses the issue, and he winds up by saying, nah, I don't think so. But, so anyhow, there is that text in the literature, and I had, I had that in my mind. So we took it down because we got a lot of reaction to it, and probably justifiably so, because it wasn't clear what I meant by science. And uh, we put up another one that, uh, you know, uh, advertises the Chadwick uh, theme of the course. And again, the course is called Who Called? Who Called? Who Killed? Who Killed Cock Robin? With Dr. Pauly. In the, 19, in the 1800s, the argument of a life force was defeated by fic- physicalism. The reduction of organic nature to dead matter understood as a combination of physical and chemical forces, learn how the organic movement in California, which began here at UCSC with the garden that Paul helped get started with Alan Chadwick, and why organic is philosophy and not just food. Thank yeah, I'll, you. I'll give you one big clue. Uh, just about the time they artificially synthesized urea and the origins of organic chemistry, they started calling factories plants. And there you go. Yeah, think of an atomic energy plant. We're just plants, folks. No, we're just... Uh, you know, and the reason was because a plant is a little factory and a factory is a you know, big plant in terms of making chemicals. And there you go, folks. Another perfectly wonderful afternoon at Artists on Art here at KZSE. Please stay tuned for new slang. We're going to be having a new program coming up in the new quarter. I want to thank Vanya Benavides of Vabulous Media for live tweeting and Facebooking during the show today. If you missed any part of it, please go to artistonart.com. You'll be able to see a video and have the podcast. Nice to be with you again, Nada. It was a great pleasure to have you. Everybody stay tuned for new slang, and thanks for listening.